Welcome to the Business of Travel, the official podcast of the Global Business Travel Association. I'm Jorge Mesa, co-chair of the GBTA EMEA Risk Committee, based in Barcelona, and I will be your host for today's episode. And with me today, some members of the GBTA Risk Committee from the U.S. region and EMEA regions. Could you please introduce yourselves? I'm Bruce McIndoe from Washington, D.C. and the president of McIndoe Risk Advisory. I'm Suzanne Sangiovese. I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark, and I am the director of travel and technology at Riskline. And I am Vasilis Genetis. I'm based in London and I'm an embedded travel security lead responsible for the EMEA region. Thank you all for being here today with me. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, individual profile risk. Individual profile risk in travel risk management refers to the unique set of factors and characteristics associated with a specific traveler that might impact their safety and well-being during a trip. I will start asking you all, why is this so important? Why is this um, uh, individual risk profile? Why well, we need to pay attention to this? So, Bruce, do you want to kick the ball? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, having an individual risk profile has been important for me for 20 years, but it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> so it's hard. <laughs> um, I mean, think about it. It's like right now we pretty much focus on when somebody goes somewhere, so location at a particular date and time, and that's it. We don't you know, think about like health concerns, immunizations, and those kind of things. We kind of... Re- we dump a bunch of information on the traveler and say, sort through it and figure out what's important. And I think we can do a lot better. Suzanne, do you want to add something there? Sure. And I'm actually going to borrow something from Bruce. He said <laughs> not too long ago that I thought, I thought that's a really good sentence. Um, it's not a persona. It's a person. Right. So everyone's got these unique risk profiles, even a unique risk appetite. It isn't this cookie cutter approach we can take. Right. That's one size fits all um, and apply to everybody. And I think it's just so important that the well-being of the traveler is taken care of. Everyone deserves to have a safe experience when they're traveling. Um, Because at the end of the day, you know, the purpose of a business trip is to get business done. Uh, And if you're not in a great mindset, if you're not having that safe kind of successful experience, how could that impact the business trip itself? Daz, what about you? I think I think they're both great points and uh, summarized it perfectly. For me, for me, my main concern is not necessarily why we should have personalized risk, but it's the issue with the location based risk that we're currently seeing and which is being adopted by most major companies around the world. It's, It's very US centric, shall we say. Um, But then how does that apply for a Chinese national traveling to a different destination? The risks may not be relevant. um, And when people start to dig into what's driving our risk scores, um, especially with regards to business travel, we um, travel security professionals run the risk of losing credibility um, because we will link out to the U.S. State Department advisories or all of these Western intelligence brands that don't really consider their personal circumstances or their personal risk characteristics Um, and for that if not for anything else um, for our credibility as travel risk professionals i think we should be doing a better job in this space and this is perfect because i was going to ask a next question was about which elements we should consider on the individual risk profile so i'm going to continue a little bit with us here because you are mentioning this is the US centric on the on the country. So can you provide an example of how that could be different? Uh, so what happened with certain nationals and nationals go to certain places and so on? Um, I suppose off the top of my hat at the moment, considering the Israeli Gaza conflict, um, travelers for Europeans or US nationals is relatively safe if you're heading to central Israel at this moment in time. Um, The rockets from Hamas have ceased firing towards um, Herzliya or Tel Aviv or anywhere else in the central regions. But how does your risk profile change if you were an Arab national who doesn't hold, if your country doesn't hold uh, diplomatic relations with Israel? 
um, it's a completely different risk profile. And I'll use the example of an Israeli uh, Iranian passport holder heading to Israel. You'd have a completely separate risk profile to that of an American citizen. Um, and that's something that you need to be considering. And that's just one short example there. That's a right example. Uh, Bruce, do you have any other examples about, um, you know, uh, individual risk profiles, um, examples? Um, we see examples every day. <laughs> um, I mean, think about it, whether it's religious background, as he as you know, he was mentioning or sexual orientation or particular health, you know, issue that you may have even from allergies or, you know, that could be death inducing right you know just all of these things that makes you unique if a threat is there and you're vulnerable to it now you have risk right if i'm superman and i travel okay you know i don't care you know whatever right but no, people aren't superman so yeah so it's 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 complicated in the sense that the variations and the permutations are just so many right but at the end of the day, they can be kind of classified into kind of what is what are the most critical risk or threat issues that we should address for people, right? Not persona mm -hmm. going to a location. And that's why, you know, you speak about, you know, U.S. centric. Well, I, I, you know, we we, you know, had that challenge 10, 20 years ago. Right. You know, I would say now, you know the risk lines and the crisis 24s and ISOSs are a lot better about, you know, not pointing people just generically to the State Department, right? Because a German or, like he said, a Chinese or whatever traveling is very different than a U.S. traveling, right? And so just right there, those, you know, Ministry of Foreign Affairs are, you know, all take into account for their citizens but OK, well, what about their citizens and their pro personal profile? Well, they can't get there. But, you know, with technology now, it's within reach that we can mm -hmm. actually start creating this very personalized, you know, information, distilling 20 or 30 pages of information to like six. This is what you need to pay attention to. Right. <laughs> and that's and that's where I want to go. And and Susanna, if you want to to add something here. Go, um, Suzanne. But I, I, I have the next uh, question that is kind of like uh, linked to what Bruce was saying there. So, yeah, you know what? It's funny. I was going to say, because this is so complicated. How do we make make it simpler, right? <laughs> if only there's some technical way that we could get the, the simplified of the complex because it isn't just, well, I'm a female traveler, right? It's my nationality. Um, it could be your sexual orientation, your health status, your um, ability, if you have any um, impairment, you know, with mobility, anything like this, religion, all of that wrapped together. So again, it's not even just that default, well, I'm a woman traveling. What should I be aware of? Um, it's highly complex. There's a lot of elements to kind of think about. And then coupled with that destination information and intelligence, right? And it's not even, gosh, um, you're going to a sort of what's usually classified as a higher risk location. It can even just be it's, it's you know, going to Japan or going to the U.S., Germany. Um, there's still elements to understand of what could affect um, a traveler in these locations. It's not just about the high risk areas. Uh, and this is an example that I always made if someone asked me to drive in Canada in winter, uh, me being based in Barcelona, probably I will end up being in a crash, uh, in, a, in a car crash or something like that, right? So that's kind of like, uh, um, but where to find the right information? And 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 and, and here I'm, I'm just going to go back quickly uh, again around the room. I'm sorry because I'm just having my, you know, being an OCD, I'm very organized like Bruce, <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne, Taz. But it's kind of like uh, where to find the right information, how to how we tailor to every traveler's profile. So, I mean, uh, at BC Travel, we are not going to start building up you know, a database of, yeah, I'm gay, I'm uh, female, you know, there's things that you cannot ask people, right? So um, what about that, Bruce? So that's why I'm saying that technology is amazing and will be more amazing as it's kind of tailored to this space, which is, you know, for the risk lines and those companies to, to take charge of, right? If you think about a large language model, with all of this relevant information being updated regularly, which is what they're doing now probably in a SQL database, 
And then I create a prompt that says, I'm a, you know, 62 year old white male from America going to blah, blah, blah. And I'm, you know, gay and I have I, I'm Jewish and I have these health conditions and I just build this prompt and I feed it into a you know GPT you know type tool that says, give me a customized report on what I should be concerned about and what should I do about it. Sit back for two minutes. And get a personalized report, right? And the key thing is all of that prompt pre-prompt, right? That's driving the, the 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 transform to get the right inf relevant information. I could say, you know, I'm a Shakespearean nut, right? But anyway, yeah. So you know, that's that's the key. How do we hold or keep all of that very personal information? And Vasa, I don't know if you have thought about that in your world. Yes, certainly. So it's 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 the dream sort of product that we've mm -hmm. we've been searching for. And um, and while there are vendors and intelligence organisations who are creating apps on a daily basis, which are really making headwind in this space, I, I still have certain concerns around AI um, and AI generated risk scores. First of all, we don't really understand what's driving the data or the risks. Uh, some companies aren't so transparent. And what what if there is no information out there for the AI to pull from? It could mm -hmm. tell you that an, a destination is perfectly safe or your profile is not at risk in that destination. But it just means that the AI model hasn't actually detected or identified something in that space. So while it is improving on a daily basis, and I agree with you, it's making there's some fantastic resources out there, including GeoShore, which is free to use, um, mm -hmm. Safe Esteem and obviously Riskline. Um, there are some great resources out there. Um, I just don't think we've got the end product just yet. From a privacy point of view, that's that's crucial for the organization I work with. Um, the retaining of that information, uh, it, it would have to be um, sort of traveler inputted information and the results only shared with them. Uh, I don't think we'd be able to store that data in this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think also it's understanding too, because like Tassas, you'd said about the reliability of the AI, but also knowing the sources that are being pulled, yeah. right? It's that transparency, um, because I know a lot of people are saying kind of garbage in, garbage out, right? It really depends. What are you using to train the model? What sources are already in the database? How do you make sure that um, this isn't also an AI created content piece that's AI of yeah. AI of AI. The hallucinations. With, right? <laughs> yeah, right? So how do we ensure that? Um, and I think, too, it's just going to the provider and asking, how do you vet what's in there right now? How often are also you updating kind of that information, the sources yes. that you have in the database to make sure it's not, you know, too, too old or too dated? Yeah, and that's where, you know, I get to see things that are coming over the horizon. And I'm working with three vendors two products and three vendors right now and you know that link the providence of the source information to the facts that you're pulling out of the llm uh, one is in like proposal development right where we you know bring in an rfp it processes that it goes to the com company's database pulls past performance and all that kind of stuff when you're reviewing it you can click on this and say well where did that come from and it'll actually bring up the citation Right. And another one is a news audit, you know, real time news field that has those citations linked into the model. So that's coming where you can now, you know, go to that providence, right? The, where's the original source of that information? And it's also going to be important for backing incorrect information out of a model, which is virtually impossible right now. Uh, these new structures will give us, a, you know, at least be able to say, don't use this citation, even if we can't take it out of the model. So. And I want to clarify here, Bruce, LLM, you 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 mentioned about <laughs> this for the, hey, the non-technical people who is listening, uh, and I'm consider myself <laughs> a non-technical person. What is LLM? Uh, just like you have a relational database, an LLM is a large language model, right? So it's a data representation that these AI engines use to it's essentially modeling a neural network of the brain, right? So you take right. some data and a vector and you put it in there and run it through the neural network and out pops in, you know, 
useful information. You know, may not always be correct, but uh, right. it's getting better and better. You know? Very good, very good. Um, I, I was thinking as well, what about privacy policies? Because as well, uh, you said earlier as well, say, you know, you are going to have a problem there. You're going to say, yeah, I'm white, I'm uh, gay or whatever. So mm -hmm. where that is going to be going, right? So if it's, I wouldn't put that, I mean, why not? Or yes, yeah, so, but you cannot ask as a company, hey, mm -hmm. guys, employees, go to ChatGPT, just put <laughs> your profile, your persona there. I mean, this needs to be also, there's some considerations around that, right? Yeah, the the, the thought process right now is, is that that's like a, a prompt prefix, right? You know, that would kind of define, you know, here are these characteristics, and then we want to run the model, right? And that would be private. So when I go to and I put in you know, my trip and then this private prefix comes in, then you just run it, but nobody sees that, right? And then it gives okay. you the answer. That's one model. But Suzanne, I assume you guys might be thinking about these things too. Well, I have a lot of actually more questions about the privacy stuff than I have the <laughs> answers, honestly, because really that is a huge concern. Um, I mean, GDPR, we deal with that every day. It's like, ugh, you know, having all that documentation to show, how are you keeping this safe? How are you even mm -hmm. keeping just the basics of someone's trip? Now we're talking about actual sensitive data um, and how that can be stored safely. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I think it's the key point, really, uh, and it's it's going to be the main thing holding up the advancement in this space will be from a privacy point of view. Um, me and Bruce have spoke about this separately, but I I think there is a way that you can create a tool that allows you the individual to input that information and it for the results to be generated remotely on a specific device and shared only with that individual. Therefore, the personal protected information is not shared beyond that device. Um, I, I'm unaware of any technology that currently exists in this space, but I, th I think that's the solution rather than the travel or the risk managers having access mm -hmm. To, to that, that information, to that information. In the interest of time, because I know that we wanted to keep this as brief as possible, and I think we are going to have a second, a second uh, part of this uh, podcast. So please, listeners, uh, just provide comments, and we can record a second, second podcast on this. Um, we have um, little time left. Uh, I wanted to touch briefly about when the travel that also plays a role on this because that's uh, also an additional uh, layer of uh, of uh, you know of importance uh, for individual profile risk but we're going to leave it as a teaser for next time so we'll go into that next um just takeaways from this so how because this is a complex uh, topic so but if for the listeners what what we should be um taking in consideration um, as a as a something to to work on after this it's time to grow up as a travel risk industry and uh we need to address the uniqueness of each person good i would also add here of course preparation is key but it's not also just about the prep work of getting that information directly into the traveler's hands and not just being the gatekeeper of it, but also thinking about um, the post trip, what worked, what didn't work, making sure that the traveler has the opportunity to speak with whoever is managing the program um, to feel confident enough or comfortable enough to kind of say and make some changes to current policies and decisions if they had a good experience or a bad experience on the trip. Good. And then to tie up on that, preparation is obviously key, not just from the organization, but from the individual traveling themselves. Um, the onus should not just be on the organization from a duty of care point of view. Uh, if you feel that you are uh, potentially at increased risk for traveling somewhere, ask the question, reach out to someone, do the research before you travel. Um, for data privacy reasons that we've just covered, um, your organization may not know that there's a specific concern related to your profile. Um, so raise your hand, ask the question um, and do some digging there. Just because one place is safe for someone, it doesn't mean it's safe for everyone. Um, it's a dynamic world we live in. 
And that's perfect what you say there, Taz, because I was going to say about, you know, traveler awareness, uh, employee awareness, uh, people, they, they use this, this other side of the coin of duty of care, duty of loyalty, all that. I think that's important as well, because all of these doesn't play a role if the traveler is not involved, if they are not aware that these, these things are happening. So very good. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, this has been a very interesting conversation. I'm sure we are going to uh, have more of these. Um, so um, thank you. Good. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, Suzanne, great to see you and Taz. Yeah, thank you so much. Looking forward to part two. <laughs> yeah, I second that. Looking forward to part two. Thanks, everyone. You have been listening to the business of travel the official podcast of the Global Business Travel Association. For more information about GBTA and its work, visit gbta.org. And be sure to rate and review us wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, thanks for listening.